So let's talk a little bit about prop food. Food is a very big deal in props. It's also my one of my favorite things. When I was an artisan, a lot of my job was shopping and uh, making fake food. And now I'm kind of in the big leagues, so I have amazing staff who knows how to do this stuff. Um, and I can say, hey, uh, we need 200 cheeseburgers for Margaritaville. Um, the reason we wouldn't want 200 real uh, cheeseburgers is they would rot uh, and smell and they we have you know maybe attract rats um, and it wouldn't be very pleasant for very long and we'd have to keep replacing them so um, my stellar crew decided they need to do a little research so they went to in and out burger um, and they brought back a burger and they stuck toothpicks in it and they cast it so when i say cast it I'm talking about this process. So the process, uh, they brought the cheeseburger back, um, they uh, toothpicked it together, and they made a box, poured the- uh, Resin. Resin, thank you, into the box, and then put the cheeseburger in the box and covered it up. So what came out was a floating cheeseburger. Um, so they had to go back to in and out again uh, and get more burgers and uh, realized that they had to toothpick it and freeze it, right? That's yeah, what they we have to freeze the burger so it stays solid and it doesn't float in the resin. Um, so yeah, we casted a frozen in and out burger. Yeah. So then you've got that and we made a few of those molds, right? There were like mm -hmm. six or a, yeah. And you pour another product in. A different type of resin. Yes. And then this is the raw, and it's the rawest form that we have it. There's a little bit of paint, but essentially it comes out like a real looking cheeseburger. Then there's different types of resins that can get you like really detailed. I mean, this is, this is pretty good. You can see the cracks in the bun. Um, <clears throat> so we would then paint it with acrylic paint until we get to a pretty real looking burger. And no. we, how many do we make? Like when there were two hundred in the in the stack and throughout the show, and then there were specific lines in the in the music, uh, the song about it. It's called Cheeseburger in Paradise, um, and so they talk about mayonnaise, mustard. I can't remember what they all they talk about, but we indicated that they also had to pretend like they were eating it. So. In the, in the, imagine a pyramid, giant pyramid of these burgers stacked up, they would reach in, talk about this one, put a little mustard on it. Then they would take a little bite and, you know, put this one down, pick this one up. Oh, look, a bite. And then this one's a little more eaten. So that's the way we handled that. Um, very popular item to talk about. Uh, Margaritaville was a fun show to do. We also had, a, as you can imagine, a lot of margaritas. Um, so this isn't an indication really of how many drinks there were for that show. And people ask me how many drinks there were and I counted it up at one point and there was at least 60, at, at least 60 on the stage or waiting to come on the stage uh, every night. So the amazing prop runner Gabe had to also clean all of these, um, which is why I have this little alcohol pad here. So he would come in a couple hours before the show and just start cleaning uh, all the glassware. Um, we like to try and keep it specific to each actor, but they uh, couldn't always be trusted. They'd be in a big hurry and just grab a drink and run on stage. Um, there was a lot of mixing of drinks. Um, and for that, we used some real liquid. Occasionally, if they had to pour it, we did. But largely, we try and stay away from actual liquid on stage because it's super dangerous. If someone spills it and then a dancer comes running on, they could just keep right on going and, or get hurt. Um, so this is a candle gel that you can get at like the craft store um, and you make candles out of it, but we melt it down. So this is when it's clear. Um, this is a little piece of rind, which is, I don't know, it could be, we just cut it off of a fake lemon, I think, um, and fake ice. Um, and then you can tint it to get different colors and you can garnish it. <laughs> and at some point, once it's set in a separate thing, you can whip it up and you can get this little frozen effect. So there wasn't 
maybe there was a little champagne in Margaritaville, but a lot of other shows, specifically Diana, um, yeah, a lot of champagne situations. So <clears throat> this one is a little melted. As you can see, it's been in the warehouse for a while. Um, it wouldn't normally like look like this. It would look beautiful, but I brought it because it's all ready to go on stage. So a lot of times an actor will have to come in with a tray of glassware. Um, and in order to help and protect them, we put little magnets on the bottom so they have a little more freedom of movement and they're not quite so scared. A little more about food, I guess. One of my favorite things is pastries, obviously. Um, so for the same reasons we didn't want real cheeseburgers, we don't want real sugary things on stage either. Um, so here's an example of a bunch of donuts. Here's a little donut hole. Adorable. Um, these are actually... this. Um, this is cool because this is like um, foam rubber that's in your couch cushions or in your pillows at home. Um, and we cut it with scissors or on a bandsaw. And when you do this snip, snip, snip thing where you can make it look all nice and roundy and delicious. Little paint, we got a little Design Master paint on here. Um, this is tub and tile sealer from Home Depot. Um, you may have recognized that from if you have a leak around your sink, you would use that. Um, and it's cool because it comes out white, but you can also tint it like this delicious chocolate one. And this used to have um, sprinkles on it, which were rubber bands cut up, but now they've kind of gotten worn off from use, which is good. Um, this is uh, crushed up cork. We had some of that around from something else. Um, yeah, so that's our, and here's a couple of tortillas. This is made out of felt. Uh, and this is, I don't know what this is, kind of crunchy. Let's say you have a cake in a play and you're going to have a little birthday scene. So we've made a chocolate cake here. Um, this is made out of that same foam that we've talked about before, the kind of foam that's in your couch cushions. Um, it's been painted and it's sculpted and painted. Um, it's also got the um, tub and tile sealer on it, which has been painted. And then in this particular show, when I built this, this is this cake is probably 10 years old, I must say. So they hold up really well, by the way. Um, they actually had to frost it, and then they had to cut it and eat a slice of it. So we cut a slice out. Um, I made sure before I made it that we could actually get a number of cakes that were this size so that our cake wedge would fit. Um, so you she could frost it with just regular frosting. Um, put the, put the slice in, frost over it, and then when they got to the part in the scene, they could take the knife and slice out the cake and put it on a plate. Um, the beautiful thing about tub and tile sealer is that it's water resistant, so you can wash this and make sure that this uh, area is clean, so when they have to eat it, it's clean. So this telephone is from the 20s, and it's from a show we did here called His Girl Friday. You can probably watch the movie uh, at home if you'd like. Um, these, uh, normally I would shop for this type of thing on eBay or Etsy. Um, and I did, I bought one, but they're very, very expensive and we needed 18 of these. So we bought one for reference, um, to get the weight and everything of it. You can also go online, uh, I found and buy phone parts. So this is from an antique phone parts store called Phone Co or something like that. I bought these little bells from that also. Um, uh, this is probably a piece of plumbing tube. I don't really remember. Um, but we bought the parts. We cast a lot of this, these portions like we talked about before and then put them all together. Um, another huge thing was there was a lot of phonography as we referred to it. Um, so we ended up using bungee cords so that if an actor got kind of caught up in it, they wouldn't get hurt necessarily. Um, and they had super long cords on them. So at one point, there was a, literally a whole number where they were talking on the phone and walking across each other, um, and hilarity ensued. Um, this is probably, uh, I'm guessing 50s. I remember the, well, 60s, I remember this. Um, this is called the Prince's Phone. Um, so this would indicate a specific time period. Um, 1970s here with this Lips telephone. Um, this is the 80s, so this is called a brick. Um, your parents might know that it came from the movie Wall Street. Um, this would be 90s, these guys, and of course the iconic flip phone. 
Uh, and this is today. Well, maybe last year or two years ago, but modern. Um, so another way of indicating time period and um, place uh, is with paper props. So this is a this is a more modern fake. As you can see, it's completely fake. Twenty dollar bill. Um, I also have files on my computer that are older money for uh, things that take place earlier in time. Um, and then of course you've got things like farthings and little, sometimes we use washers for that stuff. Uh, coins also indicate a time period, if you will. Um, and this leads me to talk about paper props, which is another whole thing. Um, and that would be letters and magazines and newspapers. Um, these were really cool. So this is an example of something that I would get from the designer. And um, this is called uh, Scene by Scene. And it indicates a lot of, uh, at basically the way the sh you move through the show and the items that may or may not be on stage in the end. So when we did the um, papers, it's very exciting. Uh, newspapers are really exciting to do. It's become way too expensive. I remember back in the olden days, we used to go down to the San Diego Tribune and have them run papers for us, and they would do it for a very minimal fee, but they don't anymore. Um, so I have found this amazing woman in Chicago, uh, proppaper.com, and I will send her all the pictures I want, the layout I want, the mastheads. This is the masthead. Um, that I want and then she will send me a price and I will say yes do it and make a hundred of them. So when we were doing Diana it was very specific even though you may not have noticed when Charles was reading the paper with his morning tea uh, he actually would have the actual paper from that day or that week. Um, we I worked really closely with Gabe Green and drama, the dramaturg um, and he helped me. He went over to the library and looked at microfiche. We collected these actual headlines. Um, we collected the actual pictures. And then and in the show, of course, Diana was actually wearing something like this. So it was all very specific. And we really, really geeked out on it and had a really good time uh, with it. But these are this is the actual front page from when uh, she was killed. Um, so we worked on a play called Seize the King, um, and the director had an idea of an uh, Im imaginary weapon because the, the, the story took place somewhere in, the, in a dystopian future, uh, and it wasn't clear how uh, the objects in that world appear. Um, so the only direction was that it needs to be able to stab uh, and be concealed. <clears throat> um, and it Thinking about sort of a futuristic environment, we sort of created this thing. Um, it was cut from, on CNC, individual plates cut on CNC, and then just kind of um, randomly put together to loosely form a weapon. Uh, then we showed it, we got our um, commentary, which is it's too big, it doesn't fit. Uh, and then this is the next rendition, which is the same sort of approach, uh, CNC cut pieces, sort of haphazardly put together just to try something. Um, again, didn't work too big. And then we um, finally got to the, to a more acceptable um, sort of stage. And the only direction at this point was the director really wanted to, uh, to hear the weapon. So I just started playing around with the physics of it. And as I was playing around, I just started opening it. And the moment I showed him uh, the motion, he said, yes, after three weeks of trying different things, the only thing it took is just the sound that I did with pulling it out. And he was like, okay, this is, this is what we have in our play now. By, by experimenting and doing all that stuff, um, I ended up with a lot of pieces. And uh, two years later, uh, we used them to make a totally different project, uh, which was for uh, the musical Fly. And we were working on Hook's mechanical type hand that had three fingers. Uh, and if you look closer, you can see that the pieces are pretty much the same, but they're just arranged in a different way. <clears throat> and this 
also progress to the point where it turned into this, um, <clears throat> which is a, a similar principle, but we had to make out of aluminum because it was too heavy and it was too dangerous. There was a, a lot of choreography involved, a lot of fighting with it. Um, so it had to be light um, and it had to be mechanical. It had to move. It had to have some sort of uh, kinetic movement to it. And then um, what happened? And then it got completely cut. Yeah. Um, and there were <coughs> there was another person involved that was um, alongside with me building another version of it, um, <clears throat> which is what we also do a lot. And, yeah. And there we we go at a at a problem from several different angles. There will be few people building the same prop, hoping that at the end of the day one of them will be accepted. <clears throat> and there's a the just so we're you know we're talking about fly uh this is another funky prop we made that's based on the um original hook um disney movie um where hook had uh, a double double cigar holder um, <laughs> and the director for the fly musical didn't really want to copy it exactly um so we just started trying different things and the, the only i guess the, the only requirement would be to have two cigars everything else is just kind of free for interpretation so we just went around the, the warehouse and uh picked up different things and just started playing lego essentially with random objects until we got here um, these are these are fake cigars um electronic cigars because we can have flame on stage. <clears throat> um, this is from an old pipe. And these these uh, these pieces here are actually plastic and those are used for, for pneumatics and for for stuff that's you know definitely not related to like sculpting real things. It, it's like actual hardware for from different departments, which is what we often do. We go around and steal other departments uh, hardware and we turn it into a different thing. Because all we had to do is just gold leaf it, and and it looks uh, like a new like a new thing. Um, so for the fly, fly the musical, uh, we had to build a few weapons, um, and we weren't specifically directed to it, but we decided to make them out of bamboo because most of the set was, you know, covered in bamboo, um, and it's very easy to use, um, and we just again started playing around with it because no one provided a design we were, they, they literally just told us uh make us some daggers um so we got to decide how those look and how they feel um <clears throat> and uh with this one here um this is not a very typical um level of detail for prop um um because it's often not, you know, it doesn't have to look very good, um, at least from from five feet. And it, it can it can be pretty awful, actually. You'll be amazed how much you can get away with. But often we we make the choice to go over the board with certain props to sort of um, inspire the actor, um, and not not just directly with the prop, but to show that um, there's um, a whole world of, of manufacturing and and uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of magic behind it and it, often when you give an actor a prop that lo looks like an actual object um, they they kind of bring um, something more to the process. <laughs> 